Welcome to the Legacy Leaders Podcast. Are you doing the best for your client to help them create their legacy? Are you creating a plan that goes far beyond finances to help people ensure that it becomes the driving force behind all decisions? On this podcast, hosts Katie Beth Hand and Stan Miller will help you with growing your practice and your client's peace of mind. Together, they bring the best and brightest minds to share with you how to help your clients develop their best legacy. And now, here are your hosts, Katie Beth and Stan. Welcome back to the Legacy Leaders Podcast with your hosts, Stan Miller and Katie Beth Hand. Our guest today is business coaching expert, Justin Janowski. Justin, thank you so much for joining us on the show. We're so excited to have you. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. So before we dive right in, I would love it if you would tell our listeners just a little bit about your background and what kind of got you into business coaching. Yeah, I've been in sales since I was 18. When I was 18, I sold Cutco kitchen knives, direct sales, sat at the kitchen table with my friend's moms and showed these knives. And, and they were really expensive American-made knife sets. I actually, it was a goofy job, but I loved it. I had 700 customers, sold a, a couple hundred thousand dollars worth of knives and got the entrepreneurial bug from there. I actually did some financial planning. I worked with Mutual of Omaha for a few years and with another firm in Chicago and loved that work, thought I was going to do it forever. I had a coach that I hired who was coaching me on my business and coaching me as an entrepreneur. And I just realized I loved that work and I wanted to be a coach. So I worked with another coaching business in sales, sold a couple million dollars worth of coaching packages for them, and then started my own business and had a lot of success my first year. I earned $250,000 in revenue in year one. And some of the entrepreneurs I, were working with, I was working with who wanted to be coaches also said, how'd you do that? And so I decided to start teaching them how to build their own coaching businesses. So that's what I primarily focus on now, but I'm known for sales. So that's the thing that I know a lot of entrepreneurs struggle with or have resistance to. And I love sales. I think when it's done right, it feels fun. It's easy. It's a, a win for both sides, whether people buy or not. And so I'm a champion for high integrity sales. That's really what I do now. Tell us a little bit about what inspired, I guess you talked a little bit about what really inspired you. You're a man of faith. So tell us about that and how that has impacted you wanting to found faith to him. Yeah, I, I've been doing sales for so long. I've had a lot of different sales managers and a lot of different sales experiences. And the company I was working at doing high ticket sales for. They had a coaching program they were selling for $20,000. I got really good at selling that program, but I found that there was a, a lot of conflict between myself and the founders of the company and how they wanted me to sell. There were certain things that they wanted me to do or ways that they wanted me to handle objections or things that they wanted me to say that just didn't feel totally honest and true to me, didn't feel quite right. And we were helping people with sales. We were working with entrepreneurs as well, a similar audience and doing a lot of good work. But some of it was just a little bit off for me. And that divide grew over time. And I wanted to bring my faith and my values and bring God into the marketplace. And so when I decided to start my business, I said, you know what? I want to do this for the Christian entrepreneur, for a Christian coach. And I want to teach sales, but I want to do it through that lens of integrity and my value system. And I just felt like that was really important and surrendering to God in that and trusting like to allow him to lead me and my business and maybe put a little bit more scrutiny on it in some ways, but also just invite that support. I also just love being able to pray with my clients rather than feeling like I have to have all the answers. So tell us, tell our listeners a little bit about who would your ideal client be? What would an ideal client look like for you? My most ideal client is a Christian coach. Now, this does not mean that I had somebody ask me recently, they're like, what's a Christian coach? Is that like a Jehovah Wits witness? And I'm like, no, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about like online business leaders, online entrepreneurs, somebody who's a business coach or a marriage coach or a health and fitness coach. Uh, there's all kinds of different things people do. Some people are marketing coaches, but this person just happens to be a Christian or at the very least, they're a very high integrity coach who wants to learn how to sell more, design their offers, price their offers but really wants to develop a mastery of the sales skill set. Oftentimes the person who's an ideal client for me resists sales. They avoid it. They don't like it. They've got a lot of old stories about what it means to be a salesperson and those things don't feel so good. And if they could just sell more, but feel good while doing it, everything would open up and their business would be so much easier. And so that's my most common client. I do work with other entrepreneurs and salespeople though. And one of my recent clients is a financial advisor, is a multimillionaire, very, very successful. And what I'm really known for is sales. And he said, 
which is funny coming from a multimillionaire, one of the top in the financial industry, but he said, I need help with sales. Cause even he at that level felt like he struggled with sales and he knew he was leaving opportunities on the table because he wasn't assertive enough. And so I'll occasionally work with people one-on-one -on -one outside of the, the target audience that I work with, but Christian coaches are best for me. Very cool. So a little bit, and you touch on this on your website, you have a 10 step process to leading high integrity, high conversion, one-on-one -on -one sales calls. Will yeah. you tell our listeners a little bit about, share all your secrets. I won't make yeah. you share them all, but tell our <laughs> listeners a little bit about that process. Yeah. For me, the, the first step in the, I'll, I'll give you the 10 steps in a very short version. I could teach these in three hours. I'll give you the I'll try to give you the three minute version. The three minute version is I, I teach people to have a pre-call ritual that gets them into a peak emotional state before they begin the sales call. This language might sound goofy to some listeners. And if you're a podcast listener, you might be like, yeah, that's for me. But what I know is when I feel my best, I get better results and emotions really contagious. That's why when people laugh, we laugh. When people cry, we feel sad. And so we want to make sure that we're in an emotional state of confidence and peace and ease and love and that we can bring that state to our prospects on a sales conversation. So we teach them how to have a great pre-call ritual. We teach them how to get in a rapport in a sales conversation, which I believe should be pretty short, 30, 60, maybe 90 seconds. I think if we spend too much time trying to build rapport, it's a form of sales avoidance and mm -hmm. it can start to feel like we're there for something else. And then the sales pitch later feels awkward or uncomfortable or strange. What I want to get people to is being in rapport by communicating in a way the other person can receive, paying attention to their volume, their pace of communication, the language that they use, shared language and how we communicate is really important to being in rapport. And then we want to pre-frame the conversation is step three. And, and this to me is the most important step. It's where we tell people what we're going to do during the conversation. We get consent to sell. And so it might be to say a simple version of this is like, hey, John, I'm so happy that Stan connected us. I'm not sure what he had in mind, but I just love to learn a little bit about your business, share what I do and see how we can support each other. Does that sound okay? That's like a very informal version of a, a preframe I might give. Or if somebody referred me to somebody who's an ideal client and they know what they're getting into, I'm probably gonna use a more formal preframe. Like, hey, Katie, thanks so much for taking the time to connect with me today. I wanna make the best use of your time and mine. So I just like to lay out a simple structure for this call. Would that be okay? Yes, cool. The reason we're talking is Stan introduced us, tells me you're a great coach and also a faithful leader. And I work with Christian coaches to help them optimize their business model, pricing and sales strategies so they can scale their income and scale their impact. My outcome on a call like this is to get to know you and discover whether or not it's a fit for us to work together. And the way I'd like to get to that outcome is by asking some questions about where you're at right now in your business, what your goals are for the future and what the challenges are that you're facing. From there, I can give you some perspective and coaching based on what I hear. And if it seems like a good fit, I'll explain really specifically how I work with my clients so that you and I can decide either to work together or not work together. And either way is fine. Does that sound okay? Yes, cool. Now I can get into it. And and so yeah, to me, that's, that's the most That's such thing. a great, such a non-invasive yes. kind of layout. I love that it's yes. both a, the question and your agenda wrapped into one. Yeah. Like the meeting agenda, not a hidden agenda, but yeah. I love that you're both kind of getting consent for the conversation and then also really talking through, hey, this is what to expect. I love when people do that on calls. I've been on so many meetings and virtual calls and Zoom calls where somebody asks to meet with me. I really don't have any idea what they're looking for or what they are asking me for. And I feel like that makes people uncomfortable. I start those calls wondering if I'm underprepared for the conversation. So I love it when people start conversations and online meetings like that, because it really helps put me at ease. And then I'm happy to sit back and listen to you talk about what it is that you do and how we can work together. So I love that totally. just on a, just in a, a general business sense. I think that's great. Yeah, totally. And I, I, I agree. Like it's that transparency and professionalism that's communicated, like just makes everybody feel more comfortable. And I know I'm, I, I said, I do this in three minutes and obviously I'm not, it's hard for me to do it in three minutes. I'd love to give it an example of what it could look like for a financial advisor. I know you've got a lot of financial advisors in your audience. Would that be okay? Yeah, that'd be great. So a preframe for a financial advisor, again, like they'll tailor it to their audience and their business, but it could sound something like this. Hey, John, thanks so much for taking the time to connect today. I want to make the best use of your time and mine. So I just like to lay out a simple structure for this conversation. Would that be okay? Yes. Cool. Well, the reason we're talking is I got introduced to you by Sharon down the street and Sharon tells me that you're a great person and that you have a family that you really care about. 
And what I do is I help people with families protect their assets and grow their retirement uh, income so that they can have the lifestyle that they want and provide for their family now and in the future. And so my outcome on a conversation like this is to get to know you better and to ask some questions about where you're at financially right now, what your history has been with money and your journey around money, maybe some of the stories that you have. And then I'd love to talk to you about your goals for the future. What big financial purchases are important to you? What kind of lifestyle do you want in retirement? What are your vision? What's your vision around giving and, and philanthropy and, and providing for your kids beyond your lifetime and, and your legacy? And then from there, I want to talk about some of the challenges that you have around money, some of the fears that you have. And we can talk about how to alleviate some of those challenges and fears. I can give you some ideas today that I know can help, whether we work together or not. And then if it does seem like it's a fit for us to work together, I'll share more about how I work with my clients. And you and I can decide either to take the next step together or not take the next step together. And either way is fine. Does that sound okay? Now I'm making that up right now. My language was off a little bit. Right, right, right. But you can see how that could put the client right. at ease and help them understand what's coming. And then if they agree and give consent to all that up front, then it's not going to be uncomfortable when we ask questions about where they're at because they already agreed that we would do that. We already shared that up front. It's not going to be weird when we ask for the business later because they expected that because we told them up front. So that transparency really helps. Absolutely. That makes perfect sense. And then we're just what we laid out. Go ahead, Stan. No, go ahead. I, I have a softball question, but I'll, I right. can say. All right. Now I will be quick with the rest of it. I wanted to give the pre because yeah. to me, that's the most yeah, yeah. step of the sales process. It makes yeah. everything else easier. But if we do that, then we're just going to execute on what we laid out in the pre-frame. We're going to do discovery where we ask questions about their present and past. We get really curious. We're going to talk about their vision for the future and what they really want. And then we're going to talk about what I call the gap. What are the problems? What are the challenges? What stands in the way of them fulfilling their vision, their goals? Or what are they afraid of that's holding them back financially right now? Or what could go wrong that could get in the way of their vision being fulfilled? And then I like a step called potential futures, which is, okay, cool. What's going to happen if we don't solve this problem? What's the consequence of that potentially? And then what would happen? And how would that feel? And who else would be affected by that besides us? And then the question of, okay, if we could just solve this one challenge or conquer this one fear or prepare for this one potential reality that could come in the future, what would be possible then? What would we feel if we knew that that was covered, that was taken care of? What would our experience be? Who else would that affect? What would we do with that additional peace of mind and have those kinds of questions? And then our ninth step is commitment. Like how committed are you to solving this problem? And if people are committed to solving the problem or how committed are you to fulfilling that vision for your family financially? And once they're committed, that's somebody that we can actually work with. That's, a, that's somebody who we can actually help solve problems. But for me, step nine and three quarters between step nine and 10 for the Harry Potter fans, nine and three quarters is to ask, cool, if, or, or to have a statement of certainty and one more ask for consent, which is to say, awesome. If you're committed to creating that kind of financial future for your family, I'm really confident I can help. Are you ready to hear how I work with my clients? So like telling them I'm confident I can help, asking if they're ready to hear how I work with my clients, getting that consent one more time. And step 10 is the six O's of closing, which to me begins by ask, making an eye offer. And then it's how we respond to objections with curiosity and, and asking good questions and helping them take ownership of the truth and, and reflecting on their outcomes and sometimes optimizing the offer or, and of course, re-offering eventually asking for the order again. So that process is obviously important. I don't think it should be a script with one-liners. I think it should be a conversation. And if we teach people how to have great conversations with curiosity and confidence and calm, we can respond to objections in a much stronger way. So that's the 10 step process, but it all begins with that pre-frame that sets the stage for what's going to happen next. That really, what all those 10 steps really ring true. And I'm guessing they work pretty well. So my softball question to you is without revealing names, can you give me a couple of examples of the successes that you've had with your clients. Yeah, we've been hired by some of the top coaches in the marketplace, a lot of seven and eight figure coaches, New York Times bestselling authors, et cetera. We did an event two weeks ago where we brought an eight person sales team to a Christian conference where it was called She is Wealthy. They were working with Christian female entrepreneurs. They had a $30,000 offer where they would coach these entrepreneurs over the course of a year to help them, their financial goals in their business. And we sold 40 of those $30,000 programs at this conference. It was a conference that had, I think, roughly 200 people there. So we had a very high percentage of the room buy a $30,000 offer. That's a $1.2 million event. It was pretty exciting. 
and and the other thing that's cool to give another example, a, a lot of our audience is Christian, but we get hired by non-Christians as well. We got hired by a coach in the marketplace that we've worked with for four straight years on his conferences. He runs a $5 million annual business. He's not a Christian. I've got a cross on my wrist and like my, my I've got all kinds of Christian stuff behind me on Zoom when we do Zoom calls. He hires us anyway. You got the same thing, Katie. Yeah. He hires us anyway. So like we go out and do sales at his event. We've had multiple events with him where we've done over a million dollars in sales. And he usually has a few of his own salespeople. And then I bring about half the team to contribute alongside his, his team members he has. But it's really cool to see that the concepts of how we teach and train and coach people to sell are so effective that even if I'm faith forward, people who are not will still hire me to come in and do sales for them because it just works. And I think transparency, authenticity, honesty is so helpful in sales conversations in today's world because everybody has had bad sales conversations. Everyone's annoyed by bad salespeople. And there's such a, a stigma around it in movies and TV shows and books. And our parents tell us the stories of the car salesperson, all these different things that if we show up the opposite of that, we're going to have a lot more success, but I'm not talking about being passive or afraid of sales. That's the opposite that doesn't work. That's an even bigger problem than being overly aggressive in sales. So what we're looking for is a loving, assertive, transparent, authentic way to show up that honors both sides of the conversation, win-win or no deal. So Justin, you talk about that package, but let me ask the like a broader question about the, what does the relationship with you look like in terms of what's the time frame? Or is it a one size thing or do you have different uh, packages for different scenarios? Give us a little idea of what that would look like. Yeah. Okay. So I just gave a couple of big, interesting examples. That's one half of our business. We call it partnership sales, where people hire us for just a few days to come and be the sales team in the back of the room at their conference. The other half of my business that I love is working with the newer coach, the newer entrepreneur, who's just trying to build their business out. So for those people, I'll oftentimes work with a client for six months, 12 months. I've got some clients I've worked with for three to five years in different ways. And so we've got a number of different ways that we help people. I've got a free podcast called Sales Strategies for Christian Coaches. People can listen to every single week for free to just get something. And then we've got memberships for $75 a month that connect people with other Christian entrepreneurs and provide a library of pre-recorded trainings. And it's just a month-to-month -month program where they can get training, they can meet people, they can connect inside of a network and community of like-minded individuals and entrepreneurs and support each other. And then we've got programs for five or $10,000 where people work with us for six or 12 months to sharpen their saw and, and really become great at sales and do it in a high integrity way. And then with these partnership deals, we've been paid as much as 50, 80, even $100,000 for a few days to work for uh, a company, which is just mind blowing that that's possible. But yeah, anywhere from free to $100,000 is what it looks like to work with us in <laughs> three days to three years. Yeah. Okay. So it sounds like some of this might be virtual, but some of this may be like face-to-face -face in person. Yeah. Yeah. We mostly work with clients virtually. That's the most common way we work with our clients. Uh, we hold a summer conference every year where we get together in person with our, our clients. We hold a retreat every year for our clients as well uh, at different levels of our programs. But when people hire us, if they're holding a live conference, we'll come and do it live. If they're holding a virtual conference, we'll do the sales for them directly uh, virtually. We actually got hired at the time. It was the biggest virtual conference ever held. There were 40,000 attendees at this virtual conference. This one, we signed an NDA. We absolutely can't say the name uh, of who we did right, the sales yeah. for. But we brought a team of 16 people and they had another sales team that they hired that had 16 people, sort of 32 salespeople at this 40,000 person event. I think we did $5 million in sales at that event. It was, it was a pretty wild experience. So there's though, if we want to boil it down in simplicity, we get hired to sell directly for big opportunities with high ticket, high ticket offers. And those can be very short term, but pretty lucrative with the right clients. And then we get hired on more of a long-term basis to teach people how to do sales themselves, solopreneurs, salespeople, entrepreneurs who are going to do sales for their own company rather than hire out somebody else to do it for them. That's great. So, yeah. Okay, go ahead, Sam. So yeah, I've got to ask this question. I think the the reluctance to engage in sales is fairly ubiquitous. I mean, lots of people have that. I find that I have that too. Where does that come from, you think? Well, I think people have old stories about what sales is. And I think that people believe that sales has to be pushy and it has to be manipulative and it, it, it or it's greedy or it's sleazy. 
And if you think that about sales, you're not going to want to do it. Or people think, oh, if I ask somebody to have a sales conversation with me, they're immediately going to judge me and not like me anymore. It's going to hurt the relationship. And so if we have these old stories, these beliefs about what sales is, and there's a really negative connotation around it, or we think it's going to cost us something and cost the other person something, that it's going to be this negative exchange. We're going to do everything we can to avoid that. So how do you reframe that? Yeah. 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 That's perfect. So what we do is we help people identify the story first. So just gaining awareness of the story that's holding us back is really helpful. One of my clients, Laura Neiser, had this story that sales is pushy. And I said, Laura, are you, so she gained awareness. I told her to write it down. Sales is pushy. Let's just make it small on the paper. Let's actually see what our brain's telling ourselves over and over and over. But then we have to ask some questions and evaluate the reality. Is this story actually true? And if not, what's the true, more empowering story we could begin to tell ourselves? So I asked Laura, I said, Laura, are you pushy? She said, no, I'm not a pushy person. I said, okay, if I put you on a sales call, would you then be pushy? And she said, no, that's why I can't do it. That's why I'm not good at sales because I'm just not pushy. I can't do it. I said, okay, if you were on a sales call then, Laura, and you weren't going to be pushy, how would you show up? She said, well, I'd show up to serve on that call. I'd say, okay, so is sales with you pushy then? And she said, I guess not. I said, what is sales with you? She said, sales with me is service. And she she rewrote that story. And then the next week, she had a, a coaching offer that was $7,500. She sold two the next week. That was more than she sold the entire previous year. But she had that old story running around. Sales is pushy. I'm not pushy, so I can't do sales. But what we had to reframe was like, sales is blank, but what is sales with you? So she said, sales with me is service. And once she had that different mindset, then she could sell more. The Bible, a lot of people think the Bible says money is the root of all evil. It says the love of money is the root of all evil. So there's another resistance, which is to earning because people think earning money is going to be evil or they know some people who have a lot of money who are bad or mean or greedy or don't treat people well. So some people have this resistance to earning money. I don't think money is a problem unless we start to love money than our more than our neighbor. Then it becomes a problem. But for me, I believe the more I earn, the more I can give. So money's a tool for good. So I believe that and therefore I want to earn more so I can do more good. So I just think it's an awareness of our stories and a rewriting to new, more empowering stories that we're going to have to tell ourselves again and again until we change the soundtrack, as John Acuff calls it. That makes perfect sense. Yeah. My next question, I know we're running out of time, but I really want to know, obviously you do a lot of virtual events and live events as well. And I feel like in the estate planning world, the financial world, it's one of those things we all really struggle with. How do you make sure that at these events that you're doing, you really capitalize on those and use those as a a springboard for success? Hmm. That's a great question. So events are, if, if the event is well run, it creates this incredible environment where people feel more inspired than they've ever felt before. They feel more connected than they've ever felt before, especially in person in today's world. We, over the last few years, there's been a shift in the way that we connect with each other, so much of it being virtually. So there's just this like energy of connection at a well-run event and an energy of like possibility and vision and inspiration. And so people are more inclined to be in an emotional state to buy at an event than at any other time because they're having a great experience. If we run the event well, we're also showing them what we're capable of if we're in their corner. We're showing them what's possible with us. We're showing them our coaching and our training and our values and who we are as a person. And there's more trust there. So it just it's a perfect storm of all the ingredients you need to have a successful relationship and for somebody to make a big decision, which is they're in a state of inspiration. They trust the people around them. They're feeling deeply connected. They're having an emotional experience. They're learning and growing and possibility is more present than ever before. So we can capitalize on an event. Number one, if we provide significant value, what bothers me in the marketplace is all the webinars, conferences, and events that are just a big sales pitch the entire time. I want to make a sale. Trust me at my event. I want to sell. We we were excited to sell that $1.2 million at that last event. But the event itself has to be significantly valuable as a standalone. So if they only come to that event, never work with us again, they're going to leave with a great taste in their mouth. They're going to have learned something. It was a significant value. And we need to provide tremendous value before we make our offer to take the next step. So that they're like, okay, this 
is valuable. This person is valuable. This person can help me. They've seen it. They've experienced it. They feel our generosity. Then they're more ready and prepared to receive the offer. But then there's also some strategies around how we structure the event, when we make the offer, how we make the offer, how we hold sales conversations, how we follow up that are going to contribute to the success of the sales in the event. That would all be a longer conversation that I know we have time for today. But the short thing to, to be thoughtful about is let's provide tremendous value before we make the offer. And then let's make an irresistible offer that's easy to say yes to and make sure that we have a sales process in place that makes it easy for the right people to move forward. That makes great sense. A very logical, simple process. So final question before we run out of time, through the work that you do with your coaching company, what is the impact you hope to have on the world and what is it you hope your legacy will be? Mm, That's a really great question. Thank you for asking. I think for me, the first thing that comes to mind is I I really am in my business to inspire the new entrepreneur to really fulfill on the business that they were called to build. And so helping other people launch their mission, build their business, sustain their family, that's really inspiring to me. The other bigger thing to take on is I would love to change the culture around sales. I'd love to change the way people feel about sales and really shift the paradigm from it being this like negative thing that people fear to being this loving, wonderful thing that people enjoy. I think that's possible. And I'd love to be a part of that shift in the movement of how people feel about sales. Perfect. That is a a great answer. So for all of our listeners listening today, thank you for joining us. This has been the Legacy Leaders Podcast with your hosts, Stan Miller and Katie Beth Hand. And our guest today was was Faith to Influence founder, Justin Janowski. To connect with Justin and get a free PDF of the 10-step sales process we talked about on today's podcast, you can visit www.goodsalespdf.com. And we will link that in the show notes for all of you as well. Justin, thank you again so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. You've been listening to the Legacy Leaders Podcast with Katie Beth Hand and Stan Miller. For more information on them and the show, please visit PinnacleLegacyLaw.com. If you like what you've learned today, do share the program with your friends and subscribe wherever podcasts are found.